so I found out um, very recently, actually, that I am very strictly forbidden to fly this in this room with you in the room because lawyers suck <laughs> but they are a barrel of laughs oh thank you actually i've got one okay. yeah you can wander around All right, I, yeah so i can two fist it too um sorry about that the but, lawyer suck part is off the audio so that's great great so lawyers suck <laughs> Our lawyers suck, but they are a barrel of laughs compared to the insurance people. And I have been spending a lot of time with people whose jobs are risk management people. That's their job. And yeah, so as Gary said, I, uh, I started the first drone journalism lab uh, in the world. Uh, we were also the, the very first to get a cease and desist order from the federal government. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience that getting a cease and desist order from a federal agency is an exhilarating experience, one I highly encourage. Um, and so I tend to be a little bit rebellious with this kind of thing. So I'm going to say screw the lawyers and I'm going to do something that I've always wanted to do and I'm going to add music to it. So, there. Take that, man, man. Just a man always trying to keep us down. So, this might seem a little silly to you, but the truth is, um, <laughs> The truth is, if I uh, actually did this in three months, I could, I could probably do it. I'd have to ask for permission. But I would also have to get the names of everybody in the room um, for insurance purposes. Insurance companies are actually um, now really starting to assert their, their interest in this. And it's getting really, really weird um, and really weird really fast. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is the situation at the moment, the way things that are being perceived now, the way things that governments and um, risk managers and lawyers and people like that are interpreting things now. There is a lot of education that has to go on. But before I get into that, uh, I actually have I've advocated to my college that the title on my door should just say Dream Crusher. Um, because when I give these talks, that's a lot of what I do, is just a long series of dream crushing. Um, but let me, start, let me start by building you up just a little bit. So um, we had some, a little bit of weirdness with the, uh, with the uh, video here. Um, but what drones are going to give us is an ability to look at our world in just a slightly different way. And this is a video done by a former student of mine now, Ben Kramer, who's now at the uh, BuzzFeed Open Innovation Labs um, in Kenya, where rules are very, very different from here. And he was able to get close to some of the most endangered and threatened species in the world and provide a view of them that few of us will ever get. Will, will, few of us will ever get as close as he was able to get a drone up to some of these animals and look at it in a, a very new way. I think journalism done well and done at its highest levels takes you to a place you cannot go and shows you things that you would never see normally. So the other thing that it will allow 
Let's see if this one's going to work. I have a bad feeling. Yeah. Nope, it's not. Go back. This, you can't really see it, um, was a view of a, of a unique location here in the state of Nebraska called the Ashfall Fossil Beds in Royal Nebraska. Beautiful, scenic, long way away from here, Royal Nebraska. Um, in Royal, about 12 million years ago, uh, a giant volcano erupted in Idaho and blanketed most of the continental United States in ash. A group of prehistoric rhinos and horses that were about the size of deer, really, uh, huddled together in a pond to seek shelter from this volcanic ash that was falling. And there they died. They laid down in the water and died and then were covered by ash. And in the late 1970s, a professor here, uh, who I believe has since retired, uh, literally stumbled upon the site, like tripped over a bone. They have been excavating it, and they have found one of the most unique locations, uh, archaeological locations in North America. They've built a structure around it, and they asked me to come up there with this very same drone and fly over it. And it was hands down one of the most nerve-wracking things I have ever done in my life. Because this ash is still ash. It's like talcum powder. It's friable on the ground. So when you take off with this quadcopter, dust would fly everywhere. And these people who had spent a lifetime slowly removing that dust from these bones really did not appreciate that. So they wanted me to fly as close to the ceiling of this building as I could. Well, on that ceiling, there are these pipes and lights and wires and all kinds of stuff hanging down. And this building's huge, so when it gets out about 20 feet out ahead of you, it gets really hard to gauge depth. So I don't know really how close to that wire or that pipe or that light that I'm getting. And if I hit it, my drone is now going to fall and crash on 12 million year old priceless fossils. I did that for an hour. I got done. I showed it to these paleontologists, and they were like schoolboys. They were just like, <gasps> they thought it was, they'd never seen it before. They'd never seen it from above like that. And it was really, really cool to them. And I was actually working um, with our public television station uh, here in town, uh, NET Television, and they were really pleased. They, they loved this. This was awesome. It's a three and a half hour drive or so back to Lincoln. So I said, hey, I want to go see my kids before I go to bed. Thanks for having me up here. I appreciate it. And I walked outside and I immediately curled into a fetal position and was just like, oh, I had to let all that stress out because, oh, my God, risking 12 million year old fossils with your $800 drone is just not something you really want to do regularly. But I did. And I provided a different perspective on something. Uh, actually, I'm, I know what's next, so I'm not even going to bother doing this. Another thing that we can do, and if you were in Dan's session just a second ago, this is another instance of being able to take people to places they can't go. This, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. This is the Dandera Dump in Nairobi, Kenya. This is also the work of Ben Kramer. He used this very same drone over here and flew over it again and again and again and again with a camera that had a GPS on it. And he got about 900 images of the dump. And we put this into software, and we created a three-dimensional model out of the dump that you can now fly through. And I mean literally through. You can go under the earth and look at it. But um, if I had both of my hands, I could uh, zoom in, fly around. You basically become the drone in the environment. Dandera is not a place that you're going to go, but the story that he was working on was about a group of people that live in this dump. They're pickers. They go through the trash, they find things that are valuable or recyclable, and they sell them to make money to live. They live in a group of structures up there around that number five. Dandera was an illegal dump. It was just people started dumping their trash there. And at the time, Nairobi was not very big compar in comparison to what it is now. And so the government just said, meh, who cares? And then Nairobi grew up around it, and Dandera kept growing. And now it is an out-of-control environmental mess. 
and they're trying to clean it up, but people keep dumping trash there. Along with growth of the city has come schools that have grown up next to it and share their playground with the dump. And when the wind blows, very predictable things happen. Being able to take somebody to this place and put them in a virtual environment is something that we are going to use drones for in the very near future. The technology to do this exists now. Now this file is enormous and would take ridiculous amounts of computing power to make it all work, but it absolutely can work. But told you I was gonna build you up. A couple of years ago when I started this, people were like, what do you mean drones? Like, is the military gonna give you a big old predator and you're gonna fly around? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about these little things that fly on the ground or fly close to the ground. Little quadcopters, multi-rotors. And in a very quick time, we have gone from, I have no idea what the heck you're talking about, to, oh yeah, I've seen those. My neighbor has one. Oh, I saw one flying over my kid's school the other day, which you should be very cautious about. If you have been watching the news lately and have seen aerial shots from a major disaster, there's a pretty significant chance that it was shot by drone. I was just in Chile for a week um, talking to a university down there about drones and journalism, and I was watching a lot of BBC World. The BBC had the first internal drone unit of any news organization in the world. Uh, they have trained pilots, uh, and I saw at least five stories in a single day that had drone shots from uh, about four different places in the world. This is a screenshot of a video that went viral after the earthquakes in Nepal. People started flying their drones in Nepal. Video started ending up on YouTube. That video started ending up in newscasts. And you have this perspective of how many people are out on the streets and you have this perspective of how much damage has happened. And you see this site here where something very large has clearly been destroyed. But in this one image, you see both the promise and the peril. And when I look at it, let me show you what I see. This is the general flight path that the pilot took. And he takes it directly overhead of some very large crowds. If he's not paying attention to his battery monitor, if an engine goes out, if his connection is dropped between his controller and his drone, depending on the model, it'll go tumbling to the ground. There's nowhere for it to go that isn't going to hurt someone in a dense crowd like that. This is a World Heritage Site. The Nepalese government worried that all of these drone shots were basically doing reconnaissance for antiquities thieves. And so, they banned drones within a few days. Now let me tell you why I am really pissed about this. It's not because a sovereign government decided to exercise their rights to regulate their airspace. Do what you gotta. I had a funder that two hours after this story was posted was gonna give me a big pile of cash to take students to Nepal and do a bunch of drone work. We were hours away from signing the agreement and booking flights and going. And then I got a text message that said, uh-oh, with a link. And I pulled it up and I showed it to them and they said, mm. Sorry, can't do it. This close. My wife was like, <laughs> she did not want me going to Nepal. But this concerns me. Drones have a very clear First Amendment purpose. They are a flying camera. They are very useful for news gathering. A photo taken on the street in public is protected by the First Amendment here in the United States. A photograph taken from the air at a certain altitude is also protected by
by the First Amendment of the United States. But drones enter into a giant stew of worries and it has triggered a lot of overregulation, some of which directly intrudes upon free speech and free press rights. Globally, it's worse. If you want to fly internationally, you enter into a whole new world of stuff that you've got to figure out. Every society, and indeed every region of this country, has their own ideas and customs about privacy. I always love talking about privacy to a foreign audience. Because it seems that, particularly in Europe, they have a much more refined sense of what privacy means and what it does not mean. In the US, privacy means, I want to be left alone. What does that mean? I don't know. I demand to have a, I have a constitutional right to privacy. No, you don't. There is no constitutional amendment that says you get privacy. Law generally recognizes a right to privacy. It's a big difference. But you ask people what that right is, they cannot define it. Ask them what a reasonable expectation of privacy is, they don't know. A lot of other places have much more refined senses of this. Every country has their own ideas and their own conceptions of private property. If you are a landowner and I fly over your property, am I trespassing? People are going, mm, yeah, mm, yeah. Property and trespassing. If I am trespassing, I have to be depriving you of the use of your property. So if you hang out on your property at about 200 feet above the ground, I would like to talk to you about your superpower. Most of us don't do that. Whether or not you are actually trespassing by flying over property has been an argument since 1783, when a very, very brave individual got into a hot air balloon and floated across the skies in Paris. And everybody went, wow, that's cool. And lawyers in Europe went, uh-oh. That whole notion that we have had since the time of the Romans, where he who owns the lands owns the skies to the heavens above, suddenly is a problem. And if people are going to fly, we've got a big problem. And it took a long time to figure that out. And really, we still haven't definitively figured it out. Every country in the world either has regulations or doesn't. There are a number of countries that have much bigger fish to fry, and so they don't have drone rules. They are dwindling by the minute. And when the United States passes its own rules, most other countries in the world will just copy them. Thank you very much. That's ours. Some countries are very permissive. Uh, in Chile, actually, uh, if I wasn't such a, uh, a dirty American and am really terrible at speaking Spanish, I could have gotten a Chilean drone license while I was there. The requirements to get a Chilean drone license are you have to be 18. Oh boy, that ship sailed a long time ago. You have to be able to read and write Spanish. They don't specify how well, and that might be my, uh, that might be my get out of jail free card. I gave, a, I gave a talk to the university down there, and they had translation. It was very nice of them to do that. Um, I actually did try speaking Spanish to the audience, and there was audible laughter. <laughs> they laughed at me, and I'm like, OK. I get it. I'm bad at this. Um, the third thing is you have to sign an affidavit that says there is risk involved here, and you acknowledge it, and you have received training to deal with it. No problem. Fourth thing is you have to take a test, a written test over the uh, Chilean civil aviation rules. Dan 151 is the, is the section of law. It's nine pages long. College students in the room, how long do you need to study a nine-page document to be able to get a 75 on a multiple choice test? hour, two, I gave it to you on the plane on the way down, nine and a half hour flight, you'd be able to knock it out no problem, right? Exactly. It's not hard. In the United States, however, things are very different. And I'll talk about that in a second. More worries. These are more central to me. These are the things that I sit around and, and lay awake at night worrying about. The thing that I worry about most with journalists is that we have a tendency toward tech lust. And when we get a new toy, we want to play with it. And we will use it a lot. We are an industry of people who suddenly see nails when somebody hands us a hammer. And so I foresee a lot of really 
terrible drone video, and actually you're starting to see a lot of it already. Do we really need four minutes of clearly illegal shots of the El Dorado County Fair flying over big crowds of people? I can tell you from experience that rodeo is very cool. I can tell you that rodeo from 200 feet in the air, not that exciting. Can you really tell what's going on? Not really. And God, the music, make it stop. Are a few of those shots cool? Yes, they are. Is multiple minutes of it? Not really. Second thing I worry about? Oops, I'm hitting the wrong one. It's my other laptop, sorry. The other thing I'm worried about is that people don't exactly like drones. And Americans seem to have two ways to solve problems. <laughs> one involves retaining counsel, and one involves the Second Amendment. And a gentleman in Kentucky chose to exercise his constitutional rights and shot a drone out of the sky. And there is a big argument about whether or not it actually was over his property. The telemetry from the drone says no. He claims it was within 15 feet of his family. The data on the drone said it was 200 feet in the air and not over his land. And a judge dismissed the charge. If you happen to live in a particularly heavily armed state, this is something you probably ought to be paying attention to if you wish to fly a drone. Because a lot of people look at them as skeet shooting targets. And the law at this point is eh, not real clear. The FAA, when it suits them, views anything that flies through the air as an aircraft. There are federal aviation regulations that say if you shoot an aircraft, you have committed a felony published punishable by up to 10 years in federal prison. The FAA considers drones and aircraft, and therefore subject to all aviation regulations. Have they charged this man with a felony for shooting an aircraft? No. When asked by media about this, the FAA said, well, we're not really sure if it's an aircraft. Well, that's funny, because when it comes to actually making people follow the rules, they're very sure it's an aircraft. But now when they want to protect one, ah, not so much. So is this an aircraft or not? Are you trespassing if you're flying over somebody's property? We don't know. Are you committing a crime by shooting one if it is flying over your property? That's also not clear. The judge in this case said, no, there was reasonable reason to shoot that thing out of the sky. Put bullets into the air. Thank God this guy was actually a pretty decent shot and he didn't miss and send stray bullets flying into the air. But that's where we're at. And the last thing, which is very new, uh, give me one quick moment to go. Oh. I think I have this up. No, I don't. This just happened the other day. It is as interesting as it is inevitable. Television, in particular, is a visual medium. And if you have compelling video, you have everything you want and need. The Russian government is using drone footage as a propaganda tool. Oh, of course, I'm going to have to watch an ad. As a propaganda tool in Syria. They are producing, and I do mean producing, really amazing looking video that may or may not work thanks to Internet Explorer being crap and this thing defaulting to it. Let's copy and paste over here into a reasonable browser and see what happens. Yes, yes, I get it. Your privacy policy has changed. 
Okay, well, we at least are getting the ad. Journalists have been asking me a long time about using drones in combat situations. Could you get closer to actual combat and get compelling video? Russia has proven the point. Yes, yes you can. And it's pretty amazing. And you can get very close to the front lines, artillery. You'll see tanks here in a minute. You'll notice there are no casualties, there are no people, and the only thing you see is the very compelling images of Russian tanks and artillery and helicopters and aircraft and all kinds of things doing brave and heroic things. Drones and drone video very, very quickly has moved into a, an effective propaganda tool. And we, Chasers of the clicks, wanters of the audience, grabbed that very, very compelling video and said, thank you very much. We will put that on the thing. And away we went. Now, the Russian government can do this no problem in a war zone. If you want to do this here in Lincoln, Nebraska, I'm here to tell you right now, things are not so good for you. In the US right now, if you want to do journalism, with a drone, you are considered a commercial user of an aircraft. That means you have to have permission from the FAA to do this. The way to get that permission right now is called a Section 333 exemption. It is literally a list of things, a list of federal aviation rules that you can't comply with because you're flying a three pound hunk of plastic on the ground, not a Cessna in the air or a small aircraft or a 747. But I said before, the FAA considers UAVs to be an aircraft and subject to federal aviation regulations. That means they are regulated in the same way that they would regulate an airplane. Right now, if you want to fly a drone, you have to have an airworthiness certificate for that drone. That airworthiness certificate has to be in the cockpit next to the pilot's right leg. I'm not kidding. That's written right into the regulations. Problem. No drone has an airworthiness certificate. They take about six years to get for a manned aircraft. And what right leg in what, what pilot chair are you talking about? There is no pilot chair. So the 333 exemption is a list of federal aviation regulations that you can't comply with. You have to, you have to write a letter to the FAA that says, here are the rules I can't comply with, here's the reasons why you should let me, and here's the equivalent level of safety that I am providing. At this point, it's a copy and paste job. Go find ones that have been approved, copy and paste them, change a bunch of stuff in it, like the names and where you're going to fly it and things like that. Submit it. Thousands and thousands of people have done this. The FAA is approving them in batches of about 100 a day or so. They're approving big, big chunks of them very, very quickly. Some days it's only five or six. Some days it's hundreds. Um, the FAA is woefully behind. They had no idea they were going to get this many of them. Uh, and so it takes about three to four months for you to get your 333 exemption. The exemption that you'll get will allow a certain number of things. It will allow you to fly during the day. It will allow you to fly below 500 feet. You can't be near airports. Uh, you have to, um, if you're flying in unregulated airspace, Class G airspace, uh, lower than 200 feet, you don't even have to tell the FAA if you're flying in any sort of regulated airspace or you're flying above 200 feet, you have to file what's called a notice to airmen and you have to get another level of permission from them. The big, big, big hurdle in the 333 exemption is that if you want to fly a drone for your job, you have to be a licensed pilot by the FAA. There is no drone license at the FAA, so that means you have to be a licensed manned aircraft pilot. Guess what I did this summer? <laughs> this is my, oh, that's my student one. There it is. I carry it with me. You never know when a breaking need to fly a small aircraft is going to break out. So <laughs> always have it on me. This is my, this is, this is my, my pilot certificate. It's not the airworthiness. This is my $7,000 piece of paper right here. That's how much it cost me to get a pilot's license. Started in May, got it mid-September. Um, <laughs> people ask me all the time, like, 
did you want to learn how to fly? And the answer is not when I started. I thought this was just stupid that I had to do this. But flying is a lot like heroin. <laughs> it's really addicting really fast. And it's really good. God, is it good. And I really miss it right now. So um, that's the big hurdle. What you're seeing now is that larger local television stations are getting 333 exemptions. Why? They still have a helicopter, and they still employ a pilot. And so the 333 process is favoring large incumbents, people who already have aviation assets. You've probably seen lately that the federal government is going to start registering all drones. Good luck with that. I really wish them luck. Is this a drone that requires the federal government's registration? My nine-year-old son got one for his birthday. Does the FAA need to know that he has it and can fly it? That's the question facing this committee right now. I have asked the same questions of my university. I understand that they want to know about that one. That one can cause havoc. But this, is this really worth me having to register with the Office of Research and fill out a piece of paper every time I fly it? I really wonder about that. There is a vast difference between these things and a vast array of uses. People have also asked me, what did you learn flying an airplane that's going to help you as a drone pilot? And the answer is nothing except one thing. It is very hard to see other airplanes when you are flying an airplane. The Air Guard base here in town flies KC-135 tanker planes. They're huge. They have four engines. They're a flying gas station. You can't miss those. That one you'll see. Another twin-engine aircraft coming at you, another Cessna, birds, even large birds, geese, hawks, all kinds of things like that. They're very, very difficult to see. So a little drone, about a foot and a half square, a little blinky lights on it, the time you'll see it is about the time that it's gonna hit the side of your airplane, or the front of your airplane, or fly right into your, into your lap. So I have a newfound respect for the worries of pilots in mid-air collisions, because you're not gonna see them until they're right on top of you. But everything else that I learned about airspace rules, airport operations, what pilots are expected to know, weather, uh, aeronautics, airplane systems, all kinds of stuff like that, could have learned it all on the ground. Could have learned it all on the ground. Did not need to learn how to fly a Cessna to know all that stuff. There is hope. Beat you down, bring you back up a little bit. Probably got a couple of more beat downs in this talk, just wait. Sometime, 2016 to 2017, the rules are gonna change. In February, the FAA proposed a series of, of rules. It's a framework for rules. It's called the, uh, a, the first step in any federal regulatory process called the NPRM. And NPRM uh, is the first step. First step to that is public comment. That ended in April. Uh, what the rules say is we're going to do away with that pilot's license requirement. Thank God. We're going to require you to take a knowledge test on the ground. It'll be a multiple choice test, probably about 30 to 40 questions cost you about 150 bucks. You'll have to get a 70% on it to pass it. You give me one day of your time and I'll get you through that thing. It won't be that hard. You'll have to fly within your line of sight. I just turned 40. My eyes aren't the best anymore. About 300 feet, that thing gets pretty hard to see. So your effective range at visual line of sight, if you're in an open field, is about 300 feet in any direction. Straight up, straight out. You have to fly during the day. Right now, the regulations say day. That means something very specific in federal regulatory land. Day does not mean sunset or sunrise, the golden hour for photographers. That is called civil twilight, and it is very different. The moment that the sun touches the horizon, it is no longer day. It is now civil twilight, and you are not allowed to fly. There are a lot of photographers who are really, really mad about that. We're hoping the FAA will change that. <clears throat> Got to stay below 500 feet. That's not too hard. 
Really, if you're flying with a GoPro, anything above 300 feet is sort of a waste of time. All of this is to say that the rules are going to get substantially easier, and I think every newsroom in the country is going to have one of these, and we'll have a handful of people on board who are trained to use them. And this is why I'm worried that we're going to overuse them, because they're going to be everywhere very, very suddenly. And we're going to have drone video of things that absolutely don't need to be drone videos. One thing we do need to start thinking about right away is our own codes of ethics. There's a lot of easy stuff here. A lot of ethical principles that are good on the ground, will work in the air, no problem. The thing that I tell people is, if you wouldn't do it on the ground with a telephoto lens, what about a flying camera makes you think it's OK? What about flying over you know, some celebrity's backyard or flying up to people's windows or anything like that? What makes you think that's OK now? It's not. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty simple. But let me give you a scenario from my past as a reporter that I think sort of sets the scene here pretty quickly. In 1999, I was a night cops reporter in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I went from Lincoln, Nebraska here as an undergrad and um, covered cops in, in Little Rock. Little Rock's a fairly violent city. Certainly was back then. I think in my four and a half years in Lincoln, I covered three homicides total. I covered 76 in my first year in Little Rock. One day, I'm driving over to the North Little Rock Police Department, and I hear a call go out to a murder that's gone on maybe two blocks from where I am driving at that moment. I had a scanner in my car. I did one of these Dukes of Hazard <laughs> spinning around and squealed through an intersection, and I got to the scene of this crime before the first responding officer got there. And I step out of my little, tri my little truck, and on the ground are three children, three boys. Their dad had gotten high on PCP and beat them to death with a rock. He was so high that he thought he was Jesus. So he decided to lay his children, his dead children, out in the yard in the shape of a cross. He then stripped off all of his clothes and went running through the neighborhood naked, where police found him about six blocks away a few minutes later. I can still see those boys laying in that yard right now, in my mind's eye. It is not something I will ever forget. What I will also not ever forget is what I heard next. And what I heard can only be described as what pain sounds like. And that was these boy's mother, who was in the front yard on her knees, wailing in the most unimaginable agony anybody has ever felt. She watched it all happen. I thought about this recently with some of my students who are interested in drones. And I asked them, would you use a drone in this case? And they immediately said, nope. Mm -mm. I said, well, hold on. What if you move back a ways? And you just got over the treetops. And you got that establishing shot of the scene. And of course, you waited until the bodies were covered. But how those boys were laid out in the yard was an issue at trial later on. It was an important detail in the story. It was important for people to understand the horror of the whole thing. Going back a block, just above the tree line, getting that establishing shot, you wouldn't see anything that would be unpublishable. You wouldn't disturb anybody. You'd get up, get the shot, get down, get out of there. You're completely respectful. Be all right. Talked about that for a minute. Like, oh, OK. That's all right. I said, OK, let's talk about this for a little bit more. If I have one, and I'm a reporter out on the street, that means everybody has one. That means the three TV stations in town all have them. That means the Associated Press Bureau in town has one. That means the radio stations in town have them. That means freelancers and gadflies and you name it all have them. And they're all out there. And it's a competitive business. And this is a really dramatic story. It doesn't take a great leap of imagination to think someone's just going to scoot forward a couple of feet to try to get a better shot. And then someone sitting next to them is going to go, nope, you're not doing that. I'm getting right up with you. And then you get into this 
tit for tat game where the next thing you know, there's 12 to 15 drones hovering over that mother. And instead of being allowed to grieve, all she can hear is the buzz of multi-rotors. And she's completely robbed of that moment. There's nobody in here, not a soul in here is going to tell me that's okay. That sounds like a fantastic use of technology for journalism. Let's go do that. You wouldn't. It's inhuman. It's disgusting. 